Well, good evening, everyone. You can leave the lights off for right now because we're going to have a little video. But first of all, greetings from South Sudan and Uganda. I am wearing the uniform of the South Sudanese uh, Christian Chaplains Association, which I wear with honor because 58 people have given their life in this uniform. And so it's one of the most dangerous places in the world. There is a line drill, drawn, and we have a map here that will help us all understand just a little bit. Uh, this is Uganda right here. So I flew into Uganda. This, by the way, down here is Malawi. This is Blantyre. This is where our orphanage and school is of a future and a hope. And again, one of the, the hallmark missions of our church family here. So from Uganda, I flew right here to the border and then crossed the border into South Sudan. South Sudan is the newest nation in the, in the world. Ethiopia is right beside here. Somalia is over here. Kenya is here. Tanzania is here. Chad is here. And then very important for what we're going to be talking later, this is Libya right here. Egypt is right here. And Israel is right here. In the Bible, and it was so fun when I was in South Sudan because I was short. There's not very many times I feel short, but the Bible talks about the, the people from Cush. And in your King James and New King James, it translates it Ethiopia, but when you look in the margin, it says Cush, and that's where these people are of Sudan in this region here. This right here is the White Nile. This over here is the Blue Nile. They join at Khartoum, the capital here, to form the Nile River, which goes all the way through Egypt and to the Mediterranean Sea. But it's kind of interesting because Isaiah 18 prophesies about these people. And he says in verse number 1, which is beyond the rivers of Ethiopia. And then he goes on to say, Go swift messengers to a nation tall and of smooth skin. And it's exactly what they are. You'll see in the pictures as we go through. There were at least a hundred guys considerably taller than I was in this group of chaplains. But then in Isaiah chapter 18, and they consider this a prophecy of themselves as they've just become a nation. In the longest civil war in Africa in which millions of people have been killed. When you see the chaplains, and I'm going to show you in a few moments, I want you to understand that every single one of them have an amazing story of, of tragedy in their lives. For most of them, everyone in their family was killed. And at the age of five, six, seven years old, they ran by themselves over 600 miles to escape. And many of them, uh, they drank their own urine. Many of them died along the way of starvation. When they got to the rivers trying to cross into Ethiopia, which is the Nile River, it's filled with crocodiles. So they'd be swimming across and all of a sudden one of their buddies that they've been with for the last period of time just disappeared. So every single one of these young men that you're going to see have faced incredible obstacles in their life. But there's one thing that I want you to notice. I want you to notice their joy in the Lord. They're worshiping the Lord regardless of things that have happened. And they feel this. It is their destiny to change the world. And here's what's happened. In South Sudan, and this is so amazing, which is now split from Sudan, that this is the only predominant Christian-speaking, Arab nation, Arabic-speaking nation in the world. So they speak Arabic, which makes them prime candidates for sharing the gospel across this whole region up here. Because everything up here speaks Arabic. And, it, it, and so in verse number three, this is what they feel is a, a prophetic... Uh, fulfillment in their life. When he lifts up the banner, they now have their own flag. On the mountains you shall see it. And again in verse number seven, 
from a people tall and smooth of skin. And uh, so it is an amazing thing. So we're going to start the video now. Uh, there's going to be some sound on the video. I'm going to narrate as we go through. So we landed and uh, now we're driving to South Sudan. Everywhere you go in Africa, it looks just like this. Whether we're in Malawi or here, uh, this is just typical. Africa uh, has the poorest people in the world and uh, an overpopulation of children. But this is them worshiping. These pastors over here came with me. This is the fortress that Far Reaching Ministry has built in the last year. Or, I, excuse me, last four years. You'll see they're flying the Christian flag. They have crosses on their uh, uniforms. And again, they're praising the Lord. They bring them once a year from all across uh, South Sudan to be refreshed by the American pastors that have come over. Now, this honor guard is incredible. The top general in Sudan is on his way here, and uh, this precision honor guard, six of them or eight of them are going to be traveling to Florida and competing in the international competition of military honor guards. This is the dormitory building back here. Every building here is designed to withstand. So, so this is the compound. Again, it's the first morning this has all been built in the last four years. You can see we're in the compound. It's built like a castle. Beautiful grounds. Uh, this is, this is Wes Bentley. Uh, He's talking uh, about a chaplain's uh, award, the uh, highest uh, award uh, ever uh, given uh, to uh, a man uh, whose uh, wife uh, and children uh, were kidnapped uh, by the uh, rebels. Uh, she was kept for three years, uh, uh, raped uh, five uh, to uh, ten uh, times a night. Uh, he never gave up looking for her. He ended up having to uh, infiltrate uh, a village and rescued her, and he's being awarded the highest award. Again, we're inside the compound here. This is the wall that goes all Here's the way the, around. Uh, walkway. And so you can see, this is what the village looks like just right outside and of this wall. Here's the, and the obviously guard this towers. compound protects these people as well. This is one of the guard towers that there are. And again, back to the main building. And the atrocities done by the Muslims to the Christians are beyond what I can tell you in a polite conversation. They make their own bricks, and again, I said, every brick is designed to withstand 50 caliber rounds. This is the village right outside. In, in Malawi, they're not square like this, but all the huts in uh, Uganda and South Sudan are these round. They actually use cow manure to hold it all together, too. So Calvary Chapel Calvary Kush. Chapel and again, Kush is a Bible name. This is Nimli, Uganda. This building was just built last year and dedicated. This is the bunk room of one of the towers. And the guards stay here. I was showing you from the outside. So it's much bigger than it looks. To, and this is dinner. So they, they slaughtered these right pigs. here, two, so two pigs and tonight. these, and uh, that's what we ate for the week that we were there. But this was a bonfire night, and again, I, I want to tell you, every single one of these people have a story of tragedy, but look how they're worshiping the Lord. And, you know, here in America... I've got a hangnail so I can't go to church or someone hurt my feeling and I'm not going to follow the Lord. And I can dance like that just in case you were wondering. I was, I, I was filming here but I was dancing before. I was filming.
And these are all pastors, chaplains. See that on their official uniforms, they have crosses on their shoulder. And they're singing, I've decided to follow Jesus. And every one of them takes a vow that they will die first before turning their back on their women and children. See how tall these guys all are? And this is one of the breakout sessions. Hello, I'm uh, Jaffa Musa Basha from uh, Nuba Mountain Chaplains. I'm working with the Farrakhan Ministry, and at the same time in Nuba Mountain, I'm serving with the uh, KOOC, which is a Kodi childhood organization for the widow and the uh, children, orphan children, and I'm very excited to give this short testimony. Uh, may God bless all of you for what you are doing over there. Thanks. This is the top general in Sudan who's come to visit the chaplains, comes in with his whole entourage of people with every artillery, uh, traveling from the capital of South Sudan. Again, they're, they're going to perform for him. He's going to be there to give the award to Moses, whose wife was held captive all that time. These guys are drawing the line. They're like the elite forces in Sudan, South Sudan. Here's the general right here addressing him, very possibly the next president of South Sudan. Here's Wes Bentley, the head of Far Reaching with that general, their personal friends. Wes Bentley saved his life. Here's Moses. He's the one that's receiving that award uh, that night. This highest award has never been given. So here we are with the generals, soldiers and entourage, all kinds of soldiers. This is the top general in Sudan. This says, whether we live or die, we will be with Christ. And so all of these are to help escort this general back to the capital city. Yes, uh, my name is Emmanuel Paul Adlan. I'm a chaplain from the Nuba Mountain, uh, Sudan. The Nuba Mountain is located uh, in the central Sudan, bordering South Sudan. Uh, I have been brought up in a family. I lost my father in 1985. He was being killed by the government of Sudan, purposely because he was an evangelist. And I, I was being brought up by my grandmother in, uh, in Sudan. And I, I, was, I joined the army as a child soldier. I took up my decision to join the army willingly in order to save my people. I was not happy to see my people being killed, being raped, and being looted. So I took up my decision by myself to join the army forces. And I was in the army forces. I, I went to school, Bush schools. And I joined the, my chaplain classes in 2003 up to 2005. And I am graduated. I went to my Anna. I'm in my field. So I came out. I came here in my refresher course. And I'm happy. I met Pastor Jeff. And he prayed for us. And he's going to pray for us. And he's going to stand with us in the coming future. And I'm so much happy to, to, to be a chaplain. So that, that's my purpose. God wants me to take the gospel to, to my people so that they may get heavenly, uh, heavenly kingdom at the coming 
judge me. And I'm so much happy. And uh, we hope we will do better to convert our people into Christianity. And we hope you will pray for us uh, as we are still struggling because Sudan is in war. And we are praying, may God from heaven grant us peace and unity so that we may preach the gospel. Thank you so much. And uh, we will be praying for you too as you pray for us. God bless you. God. The Nuba Mountains is, for some reason, what the Lord laid on my heart before I got there. It's actually a pretty dangerous place, but those two guys, Jaffa and Emmanuel, I believe in some way we're going to be connected with them. Now we've moved to Uganda, and this is a brand new church. It wasn't here. This is the dedication for it, and uh, this is a pastor's conference. Listen to this guy. church. This is what's called the farm. It's an amazing facility that all has been built within the last two years. Now we're inside the compound. This is the women's meeting. dormitories that will be able to house 600 kids and all of this was built in the last two years these will be the classrooms and this is the outside so the so outside is, the is built outside. as a fort these will it's all be displaced kids that will be here be to, to help keep them the safe. That will come here. The children will and come so from all of this that you're seeing, can you believe, has been built and in the last two years in Uganda? Because this is what the rest of the place looks us. like. Then this is, this the, is church the church that was that just was dedicated. The, the paint was year. wet Amazing. when we got there. They it just finished it. Ago. On the day of dedication... Yesterday, there were 700, 700 people, people inside, 500 people for outside. For the dedication. And uh, it, it, nothing was here a year ago, so it was totally built. So we'll go inside now. So now there's we'll 500 inside. pastors, this is the pastors that are here that we taught for a week. It was so exciting because, so unfortunately, the, the majority of them have bad theology. The only thing they've seen is what's on American TV by Nabin and Claimant preachers. And so we were showing them how to teach through the Bible, and it was absolutely amazing to watch them get it and grow. Here's some worship. And I, I can dance like that too. So. We're a little bit too stiff here. This couple right here, remember them. He's from St. Louis. <laughs> so this is on top of the water tank. There are 500 acres here. And I'm going to tell you a story in a little bit. Are we able to pause it right now? All right. Let me tell you the story. The couple that I was circling, and I said, remember this couple. Her name is Sarah. Sarah. They lived in a region that was eight hours away. They're, the guy that owned this land had a dream from God that he was to go to that district, 
find a woman named Sarah and sell her his land. So he travels to this city and he goes in and he says, I'm here to see Sarah. And they said, well, there's all kinds of Sarahs in this village. And he said, I'll know her when I see her. So they told this Sarah that I showed you, she, she had a cooking oil factory and they said, this guy has traveled all the way across and he's looking for a Sarah. War was going on and she said, I'm not going to see him because she was afraid. And then they said, well, he had a dream from God that he's looking for a Sarah and he said he'd recognize her when he saw her. So she said, okay, this is what I'll do. I'll be in a room full of women, and if he recognizes me, uh, then I'll talk to him. So he came into the room, and he looked around, and he goes, you're Sarah. And so she talked to him, and he said, God told me to sell you my land. And she said, well, I have a husband. i got to talk to him. So she talks to her husband, and her husband says, what do we want a piece of land over there for? But And she said, well... I mean, this is so strange. He picked me out of a crowd and he said, well, let's get together. And if you feel like you should buy it, buy it. And so they got together and he explained his dream to her. And she said, well, how much do you want for her land? He gave her the price. It was the exact amount of money that she had. So they bought the land and came here and have given it to the Lord. And this is what has risen from that. So, my friends, the Bible talks about God speaking to people through dreams and visions. Yeah, this is, you're seeing a living example modern. So, we can start again. This is the fort that's here, where the school is. There's the church. You can see the cross over there. And these are the grounds. We're on top of water oh, my tank. name is Pastor Agrey from Open Bible Standard Church in Uganda. I just want to appreciate Calvary Chapel for sending us and finding this wonderful Pastor Gerald just to come and be part of the teaching and the training. We have enjoyed him and we really need him to be part of Africa continuously. We really appreciate you for the good work you have done, for the good prayers given to him and the finances and the support and the guidance. To God be the glory. We pray that he, you send us more missionaries to keep guiding us and to keep encouraging us so that we can stand faithful in the word of God. Thank you. We are proud of Pastor Gerald. Please, next time, Pastor Gerald, as you come to Uganda, we request the church to come with the church, other church members and you bring you our street wife as well. Thank you, Jesus. I, I'm going to tell you because uh, he's a little bit hard to understand the story. Tombe. This is Michael. He is the pastor of Calvary Chapel Cush in Nimley, the first Calvary Chapel where the chaplains were. He also drove me from there to where we are here. We're in the car, and I said, how many children do you have? And he said, two, three. And I go, I'm thinking, you don't know whether you have two or three children? And so I said, how many children did you say you have? He said, 23. He has five of his own children. He has adopted 18 children whose parents have been killed. Is that not amazing? He's such a great man of God. He's awesome. And he's the senior pastor at Calvary Chapel, Nimoy. Thank you so much. So the songs they sang, many of them the same as here. This is the pastor's conference. This is such an amazing, incredible time. There are hundreds and hundreds of pastors here. The stories are absolutely amazing of the things they've faced and gone through. It's night, everybody's eating. He's from St. Louis. These two young guys want to be pastors. They're awesome. He's he's actually considering coming here to CBI. He's 20 years old. Hello, my name is uh, Richard Amoma, and I'm a ministry director in Uganda. We are doing a lot of ministry for the Lord. 
Uh, this time around, we have had a pastors and leaders conference. We have had Joe, your pastor, right here with us. And boy, we got fed the word of God. We have pastors. We have had over 500 pastors just around fellowshipping and getting these teachings. And we've been so blessed by that. So I just want to say hello. We'll be praying for you. And we love you. So God bless you. He's the son <laughs> of the it's woman the that bought the property. Uh, fruit that grows on trees. It's what they use to flavor juicy fruit gum. That's juicy fruit oh gum gosh, fruit. That's crazy. Jackfruit. <laughs> this is Ugandan-style longhorns. This is, again, on that 500-acre farm. So this is so far as waiting to happen. Yep, more dinner. <laughs> but, uh, you know, I could never recognize the cut yeah. of meat that I got Are until you? I watched him to slaughter it. And they just use an axe. And however it falls, that's what you're going to get. All the meat's just chopped up. Again, we're driving. This is exactly what it looks like all across Africa. Malawi looks exactly like this. This was an English colony, so English is the official language. Even though the common people speak 98 dialects in Uganda. So here we are. At now the we've gone to the Kampala. largest city in Uganda, Arise Kampala. This is uh, Arise Christian Fellowship. It's a Calvary Chapel. This guy right here is the pastor. He is Ugandan. Unbeknownst to me, and I was staying in his house, he spoke at CBI three times last year. The only Ugandan that's ever been there, I ended up in his house. Now we're at Entebbe, and we've gone to a peninsula. We've come from the mainland across where their church is to this. And this is what's important for all of us tonight. This is where we're praying about taking this empty facility here and making Calvary Bible Institute in Uganda and working with Pastor Isaac uh, that you see here. This is Pastor Isaac. This is on Lake Victoria, the biggest lake in uh, Africa. This is what uh, will be the dining hall. Again, it's not finished yet, but look at the beautiful views. This is the shower. There's a, a tank on top, and you know, you you pull it. This is one of the bungalows that there was. It was it, it's built to like house the the guest speaker or, or whatever. Plus, you could put some other people. It's got several bedrooms in it. And all of this has been built in the last like four years as well. But it's all vacant. And they're wanting us to take it over to make a Bible college out of it. So this is the little kitchen area. And then this is the dormitory areas. They have a boys and girls dormitory. So each of the areas can house eight bunk beds. So 16 uh, young men on this side. In a moment, he'll take us over to the other side. Uh, Isaac is the pastor of Calvary Chapel in Tebe, which is a great work. Uh, they also have a school. They also feed people. Calvary Chapel, San... Uh, uh, San Jose, I lost it there for Calvary Chapel San Jose helps support this. Also on the mainland where their main church is, Jeremy Camp built a medical clinic there. So there's a number of Calvaries that are sort of tied. Here's the pigs. We can turn the volume back up. This is where the girls live and this is the workshop. Okay, so right now here is uh, our water pump. We have the well down here, and then we have uh, the pipes that are leading to the water tank, which is supplying the guest rooms and the farmhouse. And then we have another outlet that goes to the biggest tank that supplies the gardens with water for irrigation and everything. So that's what we have here. 
So we fuel it and then pump water regularly to make sure the tanks are full. Well, we are uh, right now in this and I'll talk over this. This is a church plant on this peninsula. You cross the water for 15 miles, and this is like a whole other country. It's filled with witchcraft over here. The plans are to build a school over here. They have a, a house for a pastor that you'll see in a few moments. In all these places that we're showing you, in order to, and, and this is what needs to happen, uh, churches need to, to give the pastor a monthly salary so he can minister, which is $500. And so across the, the Calvary chapels, we can make a huge impact in changing this nation. Now, we're in a motorized canoe. We're heading back to the mainland. One of the things that makes this so wonderful, number one, Lake Victoria is beautiful. But it's easy to get to because once we get to the other side here, you're like 15 miles from the international airport to be able to fly out. And there's a wide range on, on different prices of hotels and things, uh, regardless of what you have. So what he's showing us here, this area right here, it all belongs to the church. It was a, a dump at one time. They bought it, cleaned it up, and it's gorgeous, gorgeous view. This building here is a two-story educational building that was built last year. It cost 65000 to build this building. So you can see how far the money goes when you're there. And again, all these buildings all the way around, I believe they have 300 in their school. And then one of the things that we, our goal has always been in missions, and Pastor Isaacs is, is to make it eventually self-supporting. So they're right by a main road. They have this great Christian coffee shop. You walk in there and play music just like any Christian music that you would uh, hear here. And so it, it is a beautiful setting. Then you can see outside here. Uh, it was it, it's an amazing thing that, uh, and this is part of what they do to raise money to feed all the children that come. This was a metal container that they've divided up into three spaces, and they rent that out to shopkeepers again to make a little bit of extra money. And I believe that's the end of it. And one of the things that I wanted to share with all of you is that. The Lord has given an open door to be able to change. We talk about saving souls. When I was there, I really believed that we could save nations and save South Sudan. And again, I, I, I want to run some things by you. You see, these people love the Lord, but all that they've ever known about Christianity is what they see on American TV. And so even though they have sincere hearts, you know, there's all this stuff that isn't right. So as we taught these 500 pastors, and you could just see the light come on in them as we were teaching through the Word, and we taught difficult uh, scriptures. We taught Ezekiel 37 and 38, which I'm going to cover a little bit tonight. We taught Revelation 2, 3, 4, and 5. We taught Revelation 19, 20, 21, 22. We taught Isaiah 59 through 63. And, and so we weren't doing easy scriptures. These guys would stay all day long. At the dedication service, that service lasted four hours. And, and so these people are hungry. And, you know, one of the young men that was standing there with that young guy from St. Louis... He came up to me because we were teaching about the rapture, and he said, Pastor Gerald, I've got to ask you a question. He said, you know, the early Christians, six million of them were killed. You look throughout history, and real Christians were always martyred. You look at our own land where so many have died for the sake of Christ rather than renouncing the, the Scriptures why do you think that Christians are going to escape the great tribulation? And I shared with him, I said, first of all, everything that you said is right. But you have to understand, in Revelation chapter 6, 
The great tribulation period isn't just regular normal tribulation that the world has always gone through. Jesus said, unless these days were short, no flesh would survive. In Revelation 6, it says, this is the wrath of God that is poured out. In 1 Thessalonians 5, it says that God has not appointed us to wrath. In the church of Philadelphia, which is the church that we want to be, it is the mission-minded church. It is the church that's not denying the Lord and not denying His Word. And again, my friends, you're blind if you don't see that there is a rise in persecution against Christians in America. We're living in a state that passed a resolution trying to tell pastors what they cannot say out of the Bible. And I'm here to tell you, I don't care whatever happens, I will never change the Word of God and we will teach the entire counsel of God's Word. God's people have always faced this all throughout their lives. But I was sharing with him that the Lord in Luke 21, he says, watch and pray that you may be counted worthy to escape all these things that will come to pass and stand before the Son of Man. For the church of Philadelphia, the mission-minded church that's not denying his name and not denying his word, the Lord promises, I'm going to keep you from the hour of trial which will come upon the whole world. I said, we can go back to the Old Testament. And in the book of Genesis, you have Enoch, which is a picture of the rapture of the church. And Noah, who was his contemporary, who lived at the same time, was carried through the great tribulation. He is a picture of the 144,000 Jews in the book of Revelation, all who survived through the entirety of the great tribulation. Then I said, you can go to uh, Abraham, where the Lord is talking to Abraham and telling him that Sodom is going to be destroyed. And Abraham asks a very important question. Are you going to destroy the righteous with the wicked? Far be it from you, Lord, to do such a thing. And Abraham was a Jew, so he's going to negotiate with God. He starts with 50, then he goes to 45 and 40 and 30 and 20, and finally gets down to 10. And the Lord says, no, I'm not going to, I wouldn't destroy it if there were 10 righteous there. And so Abraham's counting up on his hands and fingers and thinking Lot and his wife, their kids and their spouses, but what he didn't realize, the family wasn't a Christian. But I want to tell you that judgment could not come until Lot was taken out. And the New Testament says that's the way it's going to be, as it was in the days of Noah, as it was in the days of Lot. And it was so amazing because this young kid that has such a great heart, that he just saw it. And he saw how important it is to teach through the entirety of the scriptures. I had opportunity to pour into 500 pastors who are going to go to 500 churches with anywhere from 20 to 100 people. And you can start seeing how powerful it is that the word gets out because the people are hungry for the truth. These people have been brutalized. My friends, in the early 90s, when the Soviet Union collapsed, we were one of the first churches there. And we all knew Lots of Calvaries were over there. We all knew something, that that open door would one day close. And my friends, that door is closing in Russia today. That's why we're, we're starting a, a, a CBI in the Republic of Georgia, which I'll show you in a little bit. But my friends, do you know when the best time to buy beachfront property in Florida is? It's a day after the hurricane went through. You know when the best time ever to buy property in Yucca Valley? It was the day after the earthquake in 1992. You could pick up about anything that you wanted. Whenever there's been a great tragedy, and there's been a great tragedies in this land, that's when we need to go in. The people are hungry and desirous. And I want to tell you something. I know beyond a shadow of a doubt that we're called to be a part of this. I, I want you to look around. Because everything is paid for. God has blessed us so immensely that out of this out-of-the-way place called Yucca Valley, and how did all of this happen? Because, my friends, God's people came together. I, I want to tell you the purpose of the church. The purpose of the church has never been to satisfy my whims. 
The purpose of the church is not whether I feel good being there. The purpose of the church is to come against the gates of hell. And the gates of hell will not prevail against us. So the church doesn't exist for us. We exist, it's God's idea to put it together that we as a family of believers united together with our time, our talents, and our treasures. It's like the, the ones that brought the five loaves and the two fish to Jesus and what ended up happening. The little bit that they gave, the Lord blessed and multiplied and all of a sudden an entire multitude were fed. And so, my friends, we've got to understand, because we live in America, and America is a selfish people, and we are easily self-centered. I, I ran into a terrible statistic. There is more money in America spent on buying Halloween costumes for animals than there is for missions. And my friends, the average Christian gives 2% of their income. I don't know about you, but when I go to a, a restaurant and I get waited on by a waiter or a waitress, I tip them 20%. And what God asks from us is giving simply a tithe. And my friends, imagine what would happen across the board if Christians stopped giving 2% and gave to the Lord 10% even, and some can do more. We all have talents. You see, one of the reasons why everything is paid for here, there is not one place in any of our facilities that you cannot find fingerprints of people who gave of the abilities that they had because if we would have had to pay for all of this to be done, we'd still be paying for it for uh, all, of, all of our lifetimes. But you see, when, when God works in the hearts of people, then miracles happen. And I believe that's exactly where we are now. Yeah, we got a lot going on. And there's a lot of ministry here at home and around. But I want to tell you, the doors are wide open and we have an opportunity to change a continent. I've always dreamed of having a Bible college in Africa. And where we are in Malawi, it is such a great work there. And it's so, there are so many pieces that are coming together. I love Pastor Isaac. He's the same age as my children. And our hearts were just knit together. I had an opportunity to meet his beautiful wife. And as they have a church and a school. But it's so wonderful because San Jose Calvary Chapel, that's what they support is the church and school. We have Malawi, a future and a hope. We have a, uh, we have a school that we need to support. We have orphans that we need to support. We're not going to change from doing that because I want to tell you it's operating absolutely fantastic. But that's not a place where we can bring lots of teams to, to be able to come. It just doesn't work there. But my friends, this on the other hand is something entirely different. And this is a place where teams can go and help be a part. And pastors can come and share. And we can raise up the next generation of the, Malaw of the uh, Ugandans. One of the things that we're going to do is, is hopefully bring uh, a young man that we're trying to bring, make a pastor of McKellie's of a future and a hope to there. We can't bring him to America. It doesn't work. We can't get him in the country. But we'll be able to raise up people here. And so my thing that I'm going to be sharing with the Calvary Chapel pastors, which I shared with Pastor Don McClure, is pastors who are my age. I've been a pastor for 40 years. We need to raise up the next generation, give them opportunity. I was 25 years old when I became a senior pastor. And so as we begin to raise up and give opportunities to other, place, uh, other people, we can still guide the ship. 
We can still be apart, and yet we can give some time to other people to be able to be raised up and share. And rather than taking 40 years of being a pastor to the grave with me, I'm going to pour it into the next generation. And I'm having a blast doing it with Calvary Bible Institute here, but I've recognized something. It isn't just here that God wants to do it, because we can't bring these people to us. But we can go to them. And so I'm going to talk to Calvary pastors who are my age and say, don't, don't waste 40 years of being a pastor and just hang on to your church until you kill it. Because you will if you don't let go of it. Instead, come with me. Come for a couple weeks out of the year. Pour your heart into these different places around the world. And I want to tell you, the Spirit of God is moving powerfully, and we get to be a part of it. Hallelujah. Amen? Now, I believe God's doing something very, very special. And if, if we could have the world map up here, because I'm going to share a little bit with Ezekiel chapter 38. So right here is Israel, just this tiny little place. Here it says Ethiopia, and again, in, in the Bible, Ethiopia is Cush. It's very important because Cush is mentioned in uh, Ezekiel 38, coming against Israel. Put is the ancient name of Libya. And so Sudan and Libya join together right here. South Sudan is Christian. Sudan is Muslim, as with, is with uh, Libya. What is happening right now, this is Turkey. And Turkey has invaded Syria while we're speaking tonight. And my friends, in the part that they have invaded are the Christians of this region. Some of the oldest Christians in the world are, are being invaded tonight in this area of Syria, which they have with, uh, undergone all kinds of things. In Ezekiel 38, it mentions Persia. It was called Persia till 1935 when it was name was changed to Iran. All of these other names that I'm going to read to you are from these regions right here, which is present-day Turkey, Iran, and Russia, which again, when you go directly north of Israel, in the far north, you come right to Russia. Now, there's one other thing that I, I learned. Oh, and one other thing I need to tell you. Right in here is Georgia. This is the other place, the Republic of Georgia, where God has opened the door for us to have a Bible college. And I want to tell you something. He's opened the door that we're in the midst of the gates of hell, of this evil uh, convocation of nations that is coming to attack Russia from here. And the greatest place where people are becoming Christians today is Iran, which Russians can come to Georgia, Iranians can come, Turks can come, Indians can come, Saudi Arabians can come, and Americans can come. And we, by next September, are going to have Calvary Bible Institute in the Republic of Georgia where all these people can come. So that's the northern gate of hell. And he's also placing us down here in the southern gate of hell to be on the front lines on the other side of sharing the truth of the gospel in these days that we live in. Now, I want to tell you one thing that happened that I learned last year when I was in Georgia. This right here is Turkey. This is Istanbul right up here. Or Istanbul is right here. Istanbul was called Constantinople. In case you do not realize, in the book of Revelation, all seven letters, the center of Christianity was Turkey. In the Muslim invasion, they killed all the Christians. It's called the Armenian Genocide. And there were genocides before the 1920 Armenian Genocide. But today there are hardly any, any Christians in Turkey and all the churches have been turned into mosques. Before the capital of Istanbul, and this was before there was a Vatican 
It was Rome had already collapsed. This was the eastern leg of the Roman Empire as the Muslim hordes were coming. And I just learned this last year. They took all the relics of Christianity that they held in this great church. And Marilyn and I have been there. It's called St. Sophia's. And in the corners of the St. Sophia, in all four corners, is the Islamic creed of faith. There is no God but Allah and Muhammad is, uh, is his prophet. And you can see where the plaster is falling off the ceilings. You can see pictures of Jesus underneath of it. It is the Muslim symbol of victory over Christianity. But before that fell, they took all the relics of the, cro- uh, of the church, like the pieces of the cross, the articles of clothing, those things from the time of Jesus that they had kept, and they took him to Moscow. During those years, all over the world, they taught replacement theology, that God was done with the Jews. There would never be a nation of Israel. And since all of those items had been taken up to Moscow in the 1600s, Moscow claimed they were the new Jerusalem. And they had a manifest destiny to control the whole world. And my friends, that is what is driving Putin today. Now let me read Ezekiel 38 to you. Now the word of the Lord came to me saying, Son of man, set your face against Gog, which means ruler, in the land of Magog. The prince of Rosh, Meshach, Tubal, prophesy against him. And say, thus says the Lord God, Behold, I'm against you, O God, prince of Rosh, Meshach, and Tubal. And again, uh, the map that I showed you had all those ancient names on it and where they were from. I will turn you around and put hooks in your jaws. Whatever is going to happen, Russia is going to be drawn down into the Middle East. My friends, we have watched it in the last several years. Russia has a major naval point in two points in the Middle East. You know where it is? Libya and Syria. When we go to Israel, we stand on the northern border, you can throw a rock into Syria. And my friends, they are massing there now. And again, Libya is going to be a part of that as we read on in this. And it says in verse number five, Persia, that's Iran. Ethiopia, that's Cush. And again, you can read it in the margin. With Libya are with them, and all of them are shield and helmet. Gomer, and it's truth. The house of Togarma, for, for its far north, and all its troops, and many people are with you. Prepare yourself and, and be ready, you and all your companies that are gathered about you. Be a guard for them, for after many days you will be visited. In the latter years you will come back into the land. This is speaking of Israel. Ezekiel chapter 37, the valley of dry bones. If you want to read what the Holy Land was like, Mark Twain wrote about it. He said, it's a desolate land. It's a terrible land. But I want to tell you, when the Jews came back, the nation of Israel was born again in a day, May 14th, 1948. Jesus said of the generation that saw that would be the generation that the Lord would come back in. And as we look at the events of today, Jesus would say over and over again, watch and pray. Watch and pray that you may be counted worthy to escape all the things that will come to pass. That means to be caught up in the rapture and stand before the Son of Man. Israel today is a flourishing land. The biggest gas reserves in the world have been found off the coast of Haifa of Israel. The Dead Sea is worth trillions of dollars in minerals and chemicals. And it goes on to say... In verse uh, number 9, on the mountains of Israel, which had long been desolate, they were brought out of the nations, and now all of them dwell safely. You will ascend, coming like a storm, covering the land like a cloud, you and all your troops and many people with you. Thus says the Lord God, 
On that day it shall come to pass that thoughts will arise in you and you will make an evil plan, talking about this confederation of nations. And you will say, I will go up against a land of unwalled villages as Israel is today. I will go to a peaceful people who dwell safely, all of them dwelling without walls, having neither bars nor gates. Again, Israel today. To take plunder and take booty and to stretch out your hand against the inhabited and against the people who have gathered from the nations, who have acquired livestock and goods and dwell in the midst of the land. Now listen very carefully to this. Sheba, that's Saudi Arabia, and Dedan is Saudi Arabia. And all the merchants of Tarshish and all their young lions will say to you, Have you gathered your army to take booty and to carry away silver and gold and to take away livestock and goods and take a great plunder? It's interesting. Tarshish was England. So what many Bible commentators believe that the young lions of England were the United States, Australia, Canada. It's very interesting what is happening on this night. The world is protesting that Turkey is invading Syria, but they're not doing anything about it. It's just a little precursor of what's going to happen in the day that uh, this confederation of nation comes to attack Israel. They're going to protest, but they're not going to do anything about it. But my friends, as surely as Ezekiel 37 was fulfilled, where Israel miraculously was born again as a nation, and on that day their very first prime minister stood up and said this, Ezekiel chapter 37 is fulfilled in your hearing, and I hear the footsteps of the Messiah. So my friends, if Ezekiel chapter 37 was fulfilled, is Ezekiel chapter 38 going to be fulfilled? It's going to be fulfilled exactly as it said. The Lord has called to us to occupy until he comes. And my friends, the church has a mission to go into all the world and make disciples of all nations, teaching them to obey everything he has commanded. And then he said this, And lo, I will be with you to the very end of the age. And so, my friends, this is no time because the Lord warns us over and over about not living in drunkenness, not sleeping, not being aware of what's going on, not watching, not praying. And God has given to us an open door to be able to raise up a new generation, not just here at home, but also at the very gates of hell in the north and the gates of hell in the south. Imagine that we get to be a part of that. And here's the deal. As all of us come together... And we do what little bit that we can do and we give it to the Lord. He blesses and he multiplies and he gives it. I'll tell you a funny story. I got a beautiful GMC truck that I bought last year. I love it. Every time I get in it, I love it. But let me tell you why I have a pickup. I have a pickup because the plan was to get a pickup when the pickup was paid for to get an RV Because Marilee and I would like to see the United States. There's lots of places that we've never been. And we thought, you know, we're getting older. We ought to, you know, travel around and do some things. I want to tell you, we went and looked and we found one that we liked. Next morning I woke up and I said, we're not going to buy it. And she said, why? And I was looking at my calendar and I said, I don't see any time in the next year and a half that I could use it. It just frustrates me having it set out there baking in the sun and not being able to use it. But I've realized something. For at least now in my life, it's not in the plan at all of God because what's in the plan of God is for me to pour the rest of my life into the hearts and lives of the next generation. And my friends, we all get to be a part of that. And I'm so excited. I'm excited to share it with Calvary pastors. And I want to tell you that in the book of Revelation, you know what Jesus says to the church of Philadelphia? I've set before you an open door and no man can close it. So here's what I believe, church. 
As God has set us before an open door, let's be the church out here in this faraway little desert place called Yucca Valley to change the entire world for Jesus Christ and have a purpose in these last days that we live in. And so let's all stand. Let's join together in a word of prayer. Uh, it's exciting. It's thrilling to be a part. So I'm probably going to be gone a little bit more, but you haven't gotten rid of me because I'm coming back. There's no retirement in my future. I, I'm going to be a part of raising up the next generation in all these different places, and I'm going to be sharing with Calvary Chapel pastors. Come join with me. You're over 60 years old. God can use you in mighty ways. And besides that, you ought to be raising up a younger guy to minister in the church to take it on to the next generation. Hallelujah. So, Lord, we thank you for this time. We pray that you would set our hearts on fire, that in these days that we live in, and Jesus, you told us that when we begin to see these things come to pass, and we have to be blind to see that they're not coming to pass, that you have given us an open door. You have given us a direct command to occupy until you come. And so, Lord, we as the church want to go to the very gates of hell because they cannot prevail against us. And we want to see the lost saved for you in these days that we live in. And when we hear that trumpet call, we're going to be joined together with you forevermore. Hallelujah, forever and ever. Amen. God bless you.